Today, what I wanna share with you is a Q&A session that I did with a group of entrepreneurs that came to our scaling workshop at our acquisition.com headquarters. And this room was worth a lot of money. And so I thought that you guys would enjoy watching me answer the questions, watching the questions that they asked, and just in general, get a lot of value from it. So let me know what you think in the comments. This is a new type of video. If you guys have a question, please raise your hand very high. No like Tyrannosaurus Rex hands, because those don't get called on. And we're just gonna go for it. Let's go right here. Yeah, you looked excited. Okay, hi Layla. Hi. I've been watching your content forever since you started, and I really appreciate everything because uh, I'm a better person because of the videos I've watched. So I appreciate everything you do. So here's the thing: one of um, it took me two years to work on a product, to do a strategy for a business. I launched it past September last year, and we grew so fast that I have no idea. But now I do, from yesterday to today. But mentally, your mentality, when you have a business that grew from zero to like two millions, like what do you do? And, and I'm, I'm starting to cry because it's men mentally, it's like, oh my God, this is a big success. And I didn't think it was gonna be that big. So now I'm like, I don't wanna get emotional because I'm not emotional on <laughs> a normal basis. It's okay. But we could all cry. It's like, oh my God, like why do I do? Like mentally, how to prepare yourself to be stronger, to deal with success, but also like, I don't wanna fuck it up. That's how I think it. You're gonna fuck it up. <laughs> <laughs> True. You're gonna fuck it up. But you're also gonna figure it out. You're gonna fuck it up, and then you're gonna fuck around and find out. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I tell myself. And so like, honestly, like, what I, what I hear from you is you're very hard on yourself. And so you cannot, if you try to be perfect in your business and you expect that you're gonna get everything right the first time, you're in for a rude awakening. Because even me, who's done this, I've started multiple businesses and I still sometimes make the same mistake in the second one that I did in the first. And I still sometimes find myself making a mistake that I may have made five years ago. And I'm like, shit, I just catch myself sooner. Yeah. So it's like, I think you so have to release my, yourself from that business. pressure. Oh, great. And this one's the biggest success. It's, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. A lot of people don't get it right on the first one. A lot of people eat shit for a long time. And I think, I have, yeah. Yeah. And I think here's the thing is like you putting so much pressure on yourself, it's not going to help you. And so I think you have to recontextualize it. What's your business? Uh, real estate investing. Okay. So we're not saving babies. What's that? We're not saving babies. So like, if you make a mistake, a baby doesn't die. <laughs> this is what I tell myself, for yeah. real. Yeah. So like, I'm serious, like, I'm very hard on myself and I have to literally recontextualize to be like, nobody will die if, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. for real, like, if you don't get the video up tomorrow, nobody's gonna die. Like, yeah. if you miss this meeting, nobody's gonna die. And I think it's the internal judgment that you have. Like, you're gonna stumble, you're not gonna know what you're doing, you're gonna get outside help, you're gonna figure things out and you're gonna move forward, but you're gonna make mistakes. And that's okay, it's successful people and unsuccessful people have no difference in how many mistakes they make. It's just how you respond to the mistakes you make. Yeah. And so what you wanna do is that most people when they make a mistake, they stay in a state of resistance. They resist the mistake, they beat themselves up and they indulge in that. Yeah. And successful people, the most successful people have learned that that does not help you. So they immediately go, they, they take all that energy they could be doing beating themselves up and they just push it into solutioning. Yep. And so if I were you, anytime you make a mistake, focus on understanding like the best thing you can do for your business is to not indulge in feeling bad, to not beat yourself up, but to focus on the solution. Yeah. And I think the more ways that you can cope with just not being so hard on yourself, because at the end of the day, like you're gonna figure it out. You obviously yeah. have. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Thank of you. Of course. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Right here. The last year we've stagnated for revenue and my profit margin has just mm -hmm. And it's because I lack the skill of hiring, training, and then leading salespeople to do what I was doing. I'm at the point now where the time that is required to invest in the person, mm -hmm. I don't, I, I'm torn between me going back in selling myself and or hiring someone else to replace the person I have or make them better because the profit margin has gotten so low and I've like basically rode this slow decline while I've tried to gather this skill. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten to the point now where it's like, okay, 
this is a little bit too tight for how I feel comfortable and I'm not making enough money and I'm working more than I've ever, ever worked before. Yeah. And I feel like I'm just going from person to person answering questions all day long. And so my question is like, do I take my time and invest it in the people or do I say, sorry, people, I got to focus on selling and actually generating revenue for the business? I think in any time you have a scenario where things are not going right and it's due to having somebody in the wrong position, mm -hmm. there's ideal and then there's reality. Ideal mm -hmm. is that you hire the right person and they immediately get placed into the role mm -hmm. and then you coach with them, you coach them and they succeed. Mm -hmm. But how long is it going to take you to find that person? How long is it going to take them to ramp up? <clears throat> and so the reality is the business probably doesn't have that long. Mm -hmm. And so you need to get momentum in the right direction. And so in those instances, I will 100% go in, nix the person out, I will go in and do the role, and I will do it until things have turned around. Mm -hmm. Because hiring somebody to turn around a department is also harder than hiring somebody to keep growing a department. Mm -hmm. And so I would go in, I would turn it around, and then once I've turned it around, it's gotten back on its feet, and I feel like there's a cadence to it, I would then say, cool, now I'm gonna bring somebody in. And now I know what it looks like, I have better expectations I can set, and I have, a, I have more of an idea of how I can coach this person to be successful because I've been doing it for the last six to eight to 12 weeks. Mm. And so that's what I would do um, in that situation, which for anyone in here, like, like I talk about leadership and all those things all day long, but like if something's not going well and, I have, and it's a person problem, like there's also the entire rest of the company you have to feed. And that's how I think about it. It's like I have to put the whole company above this one person's ego or this one person's agenda to make sure things go in the right direction. And so I think that's probably the best thing you could do. What about the rest of the team? Like, because they still have to be met with. I still have to do one-on-ones with them. I still have to answer their questions throughout the day, like the transaction, like the fulfillment, the marketing. How many? I have seven people, six people. And how many direct reports do you have right now? All of them report to me. Mm. And then I got to sell. And then I'm, on my appointments, I do like real estate investing. So my appointments are three hours long. I'm meeting with a homeowner buying their house. So I'm not responding to anybody. And so people are bottlenecked. Like I come back and I have all these Slack messages that I'm responding to. And then I miss a sales, a client that reaches out to me. So it's like, where do I place my attention, my focus? It's going to so be really messy. Yeah. Uh, like you're going to drop the ball in six different areas. And that's better than you not jumping in and doing this. Like, you're going to drop the ball. You can also not do things perfectly. Do not have a one-on-one -on -one with every salesperson. Be like, you know what, guys? We're going to do bi-weekly group calls. That's just what we're going to do because this is where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. And so, like, don't feel like you have to do everything perfectly when things are happening like this in the business. There's, like, fat muscle bone. So, like, right now, like, if things are going wrong and, like, you're in a place where you're not going to be profitable soon, like, we go down to the bone, which is, like, we only do the absolute essentials. Like, we get no frilly niceness, nothing. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like all the niceties, they might go away for a short period of time. And I think it's important that you message that to the team and so mm -hmm. that they're on the same page. Because in Gym Launch, for example, when COVID hit and we had great leaders in place that were continuing to grow our businesses and all of a sudden everything worked against every business that we had, which was three, mm -hmm. I had to go jump it back into a ton of shit. And I was just like, listen guys, I'm gonna be really honest. I'm not celebrating birthdays, not celebrating anniversaries, I'm not giving people kudos. Like, for the next three to four months, I'm not doing any of the stuff I love doing because I don't have the energy. I have to focus it on turning this freaking business around and making sure that we can all have paychecks in 12 months. Mm -hmm. And I was just honest with the team. I don't like doing that stuff, but anything that took my attention over solving the problem, I just could not afford to do. Mm. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. There's gonna be other stuff you're gonna have to do too to like keep the wheels turning, whatever, but like turn this around first. Mm. Cool, will do. Ooh. Right here. Hi. Um, I uh, I build courses for big YouTubers, and um, this is kind of a. Um, okay, so most courses, the the lifespan is you launch, it does really well, and then after a few months, like it just goes lower and lower and lower mm -hmm. with their organic audience, and uh, I, I want to find like the instead of just creating new offers like every two months and recycling bullshit, like I really wanna make one offer that is just like the best possible thing and has consistent revenue month by month is the only way to do that once I nail down the offer to continuously be getting new subscribers through organic or, um, or just run ads towards them. Like I'm trying to find that golden goose to just have you know, that number one offer that is consistent. Well, it doesn't sound like it's an offer issue, it's a traffic issue. Right. Which is so, they're not getting enough subscribers to continue the revenue growth of the course. Right. So do you think it, it is just like it's I got to just have more subscribers or like run ads to my audience? 
to the audience. But it's their audiences, right? It's their audience. I mean, that would be ideal, but then now you're going to become a marketing agency. Right, yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> 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 Which that's, I could do that too, but it's just, yeah, it is a, a whole nother venture to... I mean, I think in an ideal world, what you do is you partner with somebody who can help them get more subscribers, and then basically you can refer people to that person. When you get big enough and you know, like it makes sense, maybe you can consider like, hey, maybe now I wanna do this as part of my business, but that's a whole nother like, box of tricks, and I would not, like, I would try my best, if I were you, to price accordingly to what you know happens, which is it dissipates over time. I'm not sure what your pricing structure is. I was going to ask that next, but um, it's just growth partner, like percentage of the course revenue. Well, then it's not like you're having adverse goals. Like you obviously are incentivized. I would just say, like, I would bring in, I would refer somebody, like 100. percent I mean, like for the longest time in gym launch, like before we had, before we were at like 40 million, like we just referred people out, and like we made millions in referral revenue. <laughs> but like it took us until we had a team of like. 75 to be able to say like I think we can actually build a marketing agency in-house and so you know to do it well you just have to have the capability to have like a whole other team that's doing it and so I would say like you're probably gonna get a lot of benefit if like you find a f person who's fantastic at doing that for them you refer them to that person maybe you guys have a little referral back and forth thing um, and you don't worry about it that's so fucking helpful thank you yeah absolutely let's go right here in the gray polo hey Layla uh, my biggest question is around like the tools, uh, specifically like software tools and things that you guys like to use to track all of the data. Mm. So I'm relatively new and I use high level and a lot of sheets like most everybody has mentioned <laughs> in the room. And so I, you know, I want some, um, if you have anything that you can call out that uh, might help me in that area. I guess I would ask like what's the problem? So it's, it's the manual data entry versus being able to just have more visibility. So there's a visibility issue on like how ads are actually performing. So we lose visibility at certain stages. And so just trying to get that visibility to have better decision making. Yeah. So it sounds like you need a tool stack? Yeah, probably. Yeah, so Definitely. With ads specifically, it sounds like Hyros. Say that again. Hyros. The Hyros. Tool? Yeah. So that that I mean that's you could look at that. Look at the competitors. Whatever. I just happen to know the person that owns that one. Um, that will track all of your ad data. Okay. So that's a really great tool for that. If you want visibility, we use that. Um, and I like the tool. Um, in terms of like all the other things that you have spreadsheets for, here's the thing: is like everybody wants a business that has like one system that will produce all of their KPIs and it doesn't have manual entry and it and it doesn't exist. Right. And I have yeah, friends. Yeah, I'm not I'm under yeah, no yeah. illusions. Okay, cool. Yeah. I just want to make sure for anybody here who's like, why do I I still also use Google Sheets? Frank, how do we track recruiting? Google Sheets. Uh, <laughs> like, you know, and like who here got two emails for the workshop or the wrong email? Yes. Uh, we have problems as well. So I would just say like whatever the problem is, solve for that specifically. And I have realized over time like getting one giant tool to take care of five things is actually much worse than finding a specific tool to solve a specific problem like you just said. And I would do that every time because if you get like uh, in Gym Launch, we use Zoho for example, and then we end up calling it Bloho because it was, it just, yeah, it just, I'll say something inappropriate. Um, it was not good. And so I would just say like what I realized there is we basically did the undoing of that or they did after we sold it and got them on just like smaller systems and then, you know, Zapier duct tied them together. So I prefer that rather than like the big giant mess. And then there's like the Salesforce route you can go eventually, but like that goes so slow and like it's so expensive that it's like, eh, I don't know, I'm not a fan. Thank you. Yep. In the white. Um, have you, how did you, how do you handle or have you experienced like the cancel culture or just like the, the, the vitriol that is spewed like on socials as a beautiful, strong woman, how do you handle that? and? Do you have any like pep talk for another strong woman? <laughs> what uh, what's going on? Uh, so I had in the last few weeks I had a, my big affiliate. I did the same thing earlier. I had a big affiliate um, cancel me, and so I'm sadly like twenty thousand of my followers are from that person mm. who just it's just women being. I think it's just bitchy women. So I'm not handling it well. Like I feel like I'm pivoting. <laughs> 
uh, my client base. Why'd she cancel you? Um, I don't know. She, I'm launching a bigger program, and I think she doesn't have a she doesn't have a business. She's just an influencer. Uh huh. Um, so she just said like, you know, Ginger's program sucks, and you shouldn't buy it now, like for no reason. Just basically. catty. Just catty. So there's no truth to it. There's no truth. Okay. I have a re I have a very reputable company, and that's what really hurts. Is like I've never, you know. Anyway, so I was just wondering if you have an experience with that, or how do you get through like the hate or? Yeah. Happens every day. I could show you a screenshot of one I took this morning. I sent it to my friend. I was like, I responded to this one. It was bad. Yeah. Um, I know. That's why. That's why. <laughs> and then I deleted it. I was like, I can't see my like, the team can't see this. It was too mean. <laughs> I'm here for you more than Alex because I, you know, I have a deep voice and people are like, oh, people say mean things to me and you seem to just like let it flow off your back. Like you don't even get bothered. I think it's just like resetting your expectations, which is like, you know, when I first started making content, I think my assumption was like my genuine desire to help people would come through. And I think it did for a lot of people. But I think I didn't realize until I watched my own content one day, because I was like, dude, like, why are people just like railing on me? Like, this yeah. is like tough. Um, and then I watched my content. And I was like, dude, I'm kind of fucking weird. Like, <laughs> like, I watched my mannerisms and how I talk. And I was like, yeah, I'm not. And, and then I had flashbacks to college of like, dudes being like, you're, you're cute, but like, you're weird as fuck. And, like, and I was like, oh, shit, it's all it's all accumulating now because I'm on social media and it's coming to life, right? Um, I'm, I'm weird too. I post like parasite pictures and stuff. So yeah. yeah so I weird. think it's just like what you consider weird and quirky about yourself. Somebody else is going to hate on that because of what? Maybe the fact that you're okay with it and you're okay demonstrating it and doing it in public, and and they're not. Or maybe because you intimidate somebody because you remind them of the dreams they gave up on themselves that you have accomplished. And I think a lot of the time it stems from that, which is like you are confident in putting yourself out there and being authentic, which many people are scared of, and then they hate you for that. And then they also hate you for the fact that you're accomplishing the dream that they gave up on, and then they're trying to make excuses by talking about why you're a bad person. Mm. And so I think that I've just realized, like, you know, for the most part, uh, sometimes there's truth to what people say, and I'm like, okay, I can understand why people say that. And then the second piece to it is just, it's just the price you pay. I think yeah. the more I've, I've done it and the more I've been in it, I've realized that, like, I just have to be okay with me and knowing that I know what my intentions are and that at the end of the day, like I'm aligned with my values and how anybody else interprets what I do, that's up to them. And they're all gonna interpret it based on their own experiences. And so I have absolutely had people slaughter me and like rip me up and make videos and do all sorts of things to try and like whatever. Undermine get, get my all attention. the good that you do, yeah. But here's the thing is that they can hate on me, they can do that. What they can't get is they can't get my attention. Hmm. Like you only allow somebody to get your attention. And for a lot of people, they become so caught up in what people say about them online, they have no attention to move forward. They're too distracted looking over here at what this person's doing. People say things because they want a response. Mm. If you don't respond, you don't give them what they want. I've and been so, doing good with that then. <laughs> yeah, I don't respond to people. You know, I had some dude do this whole video on me. I didn't respond to that shit. I'm like, I have nothing to say. It's not true. I'm not gonna give you the attention. That's not worth it. And so I think, you have to understand that being misunderstood is the price you're going to pay for the success that you want. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, let's go in the blue shirt. So question of mine is, one of the things that you mentioned is that uh, if we did everything perfect, there would be no profit. Yeah. So um, when are you willing to sacrifice, sacrifice profit for perfection? In other words, when do you know that it's, you, know, you need maybe two team members or three team members that to get you to the next level, but you might be afraid that you might lose some profit in, in the short term. So I'll put it more like this, which is even with, with anything in life, if, if we try to make it perfect, then there's diminishing returns, right? So for example, if somebody wants to lose weight, the last five pounds before they're at 13% body fat, right? Like nobody notices the difference. It's just in their head. And it's just this idea of perfection that they have. And the same goes for business, which is a lot of people have really great businesses and do a lot of things really well, but they're so focused on this last 5% that provides really no return. And so the way that I look at prioritizing where money in a business goes is just with the theory of constraints, like where if I applied this, my time and effort and money, would I get the highest return? And then I'm gonna focus on that before I move down to the next thing. And so I would say what you just gave me as an example is how you grow a business, which is you're constantly taking profit and then reinvesting it into growth, 
right? Um, I wouldn't say that's seeking perfection. I would say that's growing your business. I would say seeking perfection is doing things that have very diminishing returns to the business that, if done, you know, provide you with a very low ROI. And that's something we talk about a lot. It's like, what's your return on effort? And you know, the return on effort for somebody who has 13% body fat versus 12% or, or even 11%, it's very minimal. So like, why are you gonna put 70% of your time into it to yield a 2% return? Does that make sense? Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Let's go right here. Uh, I just am hiring on, I just uh, onboarded my first team member last week, and then I have a new one starting at the beginning of the next month. And I'm blown away by the team that you've built. And so I guess, like, what are some key things that I could be doing from the start to have them have an owner mentality, have them just, I don't know, do what you do? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the same way if you want to create the best clients is how you create the best employees, which is you focus on the experience in the beginning. And so the best thing that I ever did was I had a, a mentor who told me to put uh, 10 times more effort into onboarding somebody than I would ever thought was possible. And so okay. I was like, what would that look like? And so, you know, that created me meeting with that person two times a day, me scoping out what does the next two to four weeks look like, an entire schedule for them for two to four weeks, uh, me building out a 30, 60, 90 for that person. And basically me taking all of my discretionary time and effort that I might have been doing other things and putting it into that person that's okay. new on the team. And the thing is, is just like onboarding a new client, the more effort you put into the beginning and building that relationship and teaching that person, the more successful they are later on. And the same goes for building a team. And so if you can just apply those same principles, like we talk here about time to value, right? You guys learned a little bit about that yesterday. Um, I think the same goes for a teammate. Like how can I show them the value of working here as quickly as possible? Okay. Part of that is how I invest in them with my time. Part of that is how the team interacts with them, and part of it is how quickly they get wins. Mm -hmm. So I wanna get that person up and running and up to speed as fast as possible, because just like a customer wants value from a product, an employee wants to feel the value of the impact they have on the company. Mm -hmm. And so I would focus 100% of my effort uh, on the onboarding. I think that was the one thing that I did really well, and I, I do think I still do that really well, is I, to this day, I hire a C-level, I don't care. You get a 30, 60, 90, I'm staying by your side at the hip for you know two to four weeks, like we're gonna mm -hmm. talk all the time until I feel like we are aligned. Okay, thank you. Let's go right here. Can you just speak to how you've like, your experience with, let's say, taking someone who worked their way up through the company to earn a role in, in management or as a leader versus hiring someone from Wharton who already has the experience. I've experienced like hi hiring someone from an uh, entry level position and bringing them up to leadership and having so much trouble with getting them to reach to the role they need to expand to versus just hiring from the top, but maybe there's lack of culture or knowledge transfer is not there. Uh, to me, top down is so much easier, but I don't know if I'm just jaded with, with training existing staff. Yeah, I think you're jaded. Um, I, I also think it's not either or, it's both. Um, now, I do think most companies lead with one. And so you have to know which one makes the most sense at the point in time. So, for example, uh, when we first started Gym Launch, I did every role in the beginning. I literally ran every department. And so when I was, hired, when I was training people up, um, I was doing that in the beginning because of two things. One, I didn't know how to attract talent for people who could do it. And two, I didn't know how to, um, I, yeah, I didn't, oh my God, I had a second point and it just slipped me. Okay, so I didn't know how to attract the talent. And the second piece was I didn't know what good looked like even if I knew, right? So like five sales directors could come in front of me, I didn't know which one was gonna be best. And so those two things were working against me, therefore it was easier for me to just train the people that I had around me, right? Whereas when we started acquisition.com, um, I guess taking heels off doesn't make a difference. Uh, when we started acquisition.com, Basically, I thought about it like this, which is I wanna hire the core leadership team. That doesn't mean I'm gonna hire every leader right now. We have a ton of open leadership that we're, you know, like there's lots of people on the team who I'm continuing to invest in. I would say like a lot actually. I just know that now I have a leadership team who can help do that. Now the reason I hired from the top down is because I know what it looks like to scale a business quickly. I know what the problems are going to be. And so I can scale faster without making so many mistakes. And so to hire the leaders first, that allows me to do that. The second thing is I know what good looks like now. So I'm not worried about mishiring the wrong leaders. Um, I feel pretty confident in what I need. 
And then I would say the next piece of that is, you know, I still actually consider us to train a lot of people in a lot of things. Because here's the thing, even if you get somebody who has experience in leadership, they're lacking something else, right? Like everyone always has an area of lack. And so it's just understanding like your, I would say like value proposition for an employee is it able to fulfill that area of lack that they have. So for you, like, you know, I would even consider this. When we had gym launch, I was not a great teacher. So I constantly was jaded by the people that I was bringing in because I felt like I'm telling them what to do and they're not doing it and like all this stuff, right? Now with everything I've learned, because I've studied so much of teaching and behavior change, I'm like, oh, I was just a bad teacher. Like I just wasn't good at teaching. And so um, I also think that sometimes we, we jade ourselves because we don't realize that maybe we just don't have the skill to train people of a certain level up. Because I think you know, the more skilled the teacher, the lower level of the student they can take on. And so everybody in here needs to understand like what level of student can you take? And that's for the, from a client standpoint and from an employee standpoint. You have to know what base level skills does this person have to have? And I know I can teach them from there. But like if I've got to teach them here, I don't know if I have that. Whether it be like I don't have the patience, I don't have the time. And so that's how I think through hiring for experience versus growing somebody from within the company. Does that help? Awesome, yeah, thanks. Great. Let's go in the blue. So we have a question more about brand image and consistency. So just for context, we're a couple of window cleaners here in Las Vegas, and yeah. we're specifically out in Boulder City, Nevada. So it's small town culture, reputation is everything. Yeah. And we started out super fair pricing, referrals are everything, and then we did what you guys said, solve rich people problems, and the leverage on that is 10 times better. But now as we're kind of getting in, we're almost at a year in business now. Mm -hmm. And now that we're starting to get recurrings on those, we're starting to see that these jobs we had in the beginning are not really the highest levers we can pull. The so th the the jobs we were doing at the beginning, because okay. one of our price points of the recurring is that we keep, we grandfather in the price. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to change it. But now that we've raised prices, it's kind of one of those things we don't want to destroy the brand image and not be consistent with it. But at the same time, too, it's like there's higher leverage things to do. So mm -hmm. what would you recommend in that situation? I never kill a revenue stream without replacing it. Okay. So for me personally, in terms of grandfathering people in, I would not try and get them onto the new pricing until I felt like if I lost all of them, it would be okay. And I have consistent lead flow that these opportunities are worth that much more and I know I can replace it in 60 days. So that's what I would be weighing out, is just the opportunity cost and knowing that the opportunity cost of keeping them is much greater, so much so that if I lost them tomorrow, I would be okay with it. Um, and so sometimes it needs to be a little bit more gradual. Like you can take it in buckets too. Like you could do, send it out to a third of them and say we're doing a price change. You don't have to do it to everybody all at once. In fact, I'd probably consider phasing those things out. Um, that's how I'd be thinking about it though. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Great. Let's go in the white. Um, I have a question regarding the leadership. I would like to know what for you defines a great leader and how did you work on yourself to become a good leader? I think that when I think of a great leader, I think of three things come to mind, which is industrious, right? Enthusiastic, and then competitive greatness. And so there's a lot of leaders that are very enthusiastic and can be very charismatic and persuade a lot of people but do not work very hard um, and may be perceived as lazy. And then I think there's a lot of leaders that work very hard but are not able to transfer conviction or excitement to their teams and so everything they do kind of falls on deaf ears. I probably came from this side in the beginning. Like I was not, I was, I worked so hard like in silence and didn't communicate well. Um, and so I, over the last however many years, have tried very hard to be able to be more in the middle. I tend to be a little bit more like monotone even in the way I make content you hear it because like I speak more professionally because I felt like that was how I had to speak to my employees um, and so I would say like those two things combined with a drive to be excellent for the sake of excellence not for money or for fame or for anything else like in my opinion when I look at the best leaders like the reason that they're great leaders is because that is the person they want to be they exude care they exude excellence and they exude hard work they don't exude like a desire and craving for money or for fame or for any of the benefits that leadership may present to them. Um, and I've just found that time and time again. I think, you know, we see a lot of the leaders, leaders, um, they may be bosses, but I don't know if they're leaders. Um, 
who have a little bit more of the uh, you know, desire for fame or money or whatever. But I think that those are like much fewer than there are many. Like most of the best leaders are the people in the background that don't take the credit. And so unfortunately, they're not even well known to a lot of people in this room. And a lot of them don't want to be. <laughs> and so that's what I would think through is I want somebody who works really hard, who can transfer enthusiasm to others, and who wants to win because that's who they are. Um, and they want to be excellent, not because they want all the benefits that come with it. Sweet. Thank you very much. Yeah. Over here. Yes, right there. Currently, I get uh, all my sales and leads organically through Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. And uh, I would like to get more. So my question is, because uh, for me, I see two options. Yeah. Um, one cool. is to create more content, uh, grow even more of my following mm -hmm. on different platform, or the other one is to go to Facebook ads and do like webinar, for example, or maybe like create a telegram. Uh, they gave, gave me this idea today. So what would be the best option for you? <sighs> Either one could work. Um, I would ask you this, which is like, uh, how big is your following? Uh, what's your revenue and how much content are you making? So uh, 147,000 uh, on Instagram, mm -hmm. uh, 40,000 on YouTube, and 125 uh, on TikTok. Um, the revenue is 600,000 a year. And what is your other question? Sorry. Oh, and then um, I was saying, how much content do you put out on the platform? Uh, so I publish reels every day and like a quote as well on Instagram and one podcast a week on YouTube. Yeah. Here's the thing. Um, it's just a matter of which skill you want to tackle. There's a greater skill gap between understanding paid. So like for you to go from what you're doing right now into paid, I think it will definitely yield you a high ROI. It's also going to be hard to learn and you're going to probably like struggle with it a decent amount in the beginning and it's going to take a lot longer than you think to stand up. In fact, mm -hmm. a lot of people, when I see them stand up paid marketing, it takes between four to six months for it okay. to get actually working. Um, now, from an organic standpoint, you absolutely have room to keep going. So I do see value in continuing to double down on the organic. Um, the thing is this, is that you would need to make sure that doubling down on it, like creating more content and trying to basically two or three X what you're doing, actually results in getting more subscribers and leads. Yeah. Because sometimes people do it and it doesn't get them anything mm -hmm. else. Because that's not whatever. Maybe they actually realized and they didn't realize that like going on podcasts was how they got their subscribers, not making the content, whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, so I would probably try making more content first and mm -hmm. say if I don't see a difference in the next two to three months, then yeah. I will decide I'm going to pivot and learn paid media. Yeah. But yeah. there's more of a gap in the paid media. And so you learn, you lose less if you try to just double down on what you're doing right now. And it's easier to test out faster. Yeah. Usually when I, cause twice a year I, I do like a challenge and I post uh, two reels a day and usually I get a lot more followers when I do that. So well, let's just do that shit all the time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's just do a challenge year round. Okay. I can give you a challenge for every season. Every yeah, holiday. yeah, okay, good. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Let's go on this side. Yes, in the back of the black. As you scale, uh, we have 40 employees, and you hire a directors, and those hire the individual contributors. Do you, as the owner, still, are you still part of that interview process? At what point do you let the directors do their thing, and they're building their team, and you kind of stay out of it? Yeah, I think that I look at the competency of the person hiring. So a lot of the times when people bring on a leader, they're like, amazing, now you go hire your team. But that person that's a sales director, being a sales director doesn't correlate with being good at hiring. A lot of people have been a sales director, a marketing director, a CS director, but they've hired like two people because they've worked at big companies that they weren't even allowed to hire on their own. Or maybe they just had HR do it for them. And so I would say it depends on the level of skill of the person hiring. Like they can be a fantastic leader, but also lack the skill of knowing how to interview, assess, and then select the right person. And so that's actually how I would be doing it. I would involve myself with the people who that are a little bit more junior. And then I would not involve myself in the ones that are more senior and that I feel like have the right criteria to hire. Thank you. For sure. Let's go right here. Staying on the same topic, just can you explain how you handle yo-yo employees sometimes? 
Inconsistency? Yeah, just inconsistency, thank you. Could you tell me about the person? Um, yeah, so I had someone, I put them on, I wrote them up on, I wrote them up on, I think in February. And last week I actually saw some of the same things happening, um, same behaviors that were happening that weren't desirable. Mm -hmm. So I actually went back to the one in February and the things that he, were, that he was doing at this time was consistent. I almost felt like I could have just changed the dates yeah. on the write-up. It's like, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> so there's a concept when it comes to behavior change, which is like an extinction curve, which is like how long it takes somebody to stop doing a behavior. Okay. And some people have much longer ones than other people. <laughs> like if you've ever been on with somebody and they won't take no for an answer, like long extinction curve, you can be like, fuck you, no. And they're just like, come on. Um, and so for some people, the issue is that they've been trained the opposite way by other people in the past. And so, for example, if somebody continues to show up late after, for work, when you've told them, hey, like, if you show up late, like, that's not going to fly here, but then they keep showing up late, you know what probably happened in the past? Is that they kept showing up late to their last job, and they never got fired. And so a lot of times, you're having to correct behavior that comes from their last job, not even from what you have done. You just haven't trained them into the new behavior yet. And so uh, I would ask what the behavior is, because I'm curious, but generally, in theory, like, having an ability to, I would say like, if we actually want to improve people's performance, then we have to consistently measure the new behavior and reward it. And so, you know, for example, uh, I had somebody who, it was like, they kept having um, like instances where they would kind of yell at people. And so I was like, wow, when I found out about that, I was like, that's, that's really tough and the opposite of what I preach. And so I was like, okay, great. So we're going to measure uh, all your calls and then I want you to tell me did you yell at someone or not on the call and then every day that she wouldn't yell at somebody I would be like amazing it's great work like you've improved right and then the days that eventually it did happen where they yelled at somebody um, you basically have to make a choice which is this um, I've had people where I've done this exact same thing and they continue to get better at a very fast rate and that's what I focus on. If somebody improves quickly, even if they're not where I need them to be, that's the most important thing, progress. Not where they're at right now, but how quickly someone makes progress. In my opinion, that's intelligence. And so what I notice with one person, for example, this person I'm referring to, is that uh, almost every seven days like clockwork, there would pop up one instance where I yelled at somebody. And you know, what I said to myself was, wow, okay, this behavior's been really reinforced for a long time. You know, this person's been in the workforce for 35 years. How long is it gonna take me to train this out of them? Because it's possible, but how long is it going to take a year? Okay, so that means that they have 52 more times they might yell at somebody on my team. Now I have a question of, can I afford that as a business? And the answer was no, and so here we are. So I think that's what you have to ask yourself is, you put in the effort to make sure that you have a way to re reinforce and reward the behavior you want to see so that you can be that encourager. It's like for somebody who's on a diet, it's like, if you have somebody that's like, great work, you went to the gym today. Like, that's who you want to be for your employees when you're trying to improve a skill. It's just like, great work, you did X today. And it's just like, that's all it takes, like once a day. Um, but if that person is not improving at a rate that your business can bear, then you have to make the hard calls sometimes. Yeah. Thank you. For sure. Yes, in the black. Hi, um, Ilsius. So how do you manage your time between creating content, be, being a leader, have a company, all of your stuff like a in a, in a week? I think it changes. Mm -hmm. So I would say that what worked for me three years ago, four years ago, whatever, does not work for me now um, because it changes based on what I have going on. And so there's periods of times where I'm like, this is what I'm committing to content. I'll be honest, I've always put it on the back burner. I was like, it's the second thought. It's not the first thing I lead with. Um, also because like I would never you know, sacrifice you know, time with the team or something like that because I'm like, I gotta make a video. Um, it's probably just because that's what I've been reinforced for. So I'll say this, I've just fluctuated it based on the season I'm in and based on my working style and what I think works best. So for a while, that was batching content. So that looked like, okay, Monday through Thursday, I'm doing all this other stuff, but then Friday, we're just gonna batch for like six to eight hours. And then what I found was that it started at like, literally I would do like 10 hours, this was like three years ago. Uh, and then it got to eight and then six because what I realized is my content, by the end of the day, that the latter half, it was just shitty. It was just not good content. Um, you know, you can drink as much caffeine as you want or like hype yourself up as much as you want. It just like didn't turn out. 
Um, and so recently I've tried a little bit of a different cadence, which is um, you know, filming before I start my meetings, just like one video at a time, right? And so it's a little bit easier because I feel like the quality is higher and my energy is there mm -hmm. versus at the end of the week, doing eight hours of shooting, it doesn't really feel like I get the best. I've also just found that works better because if I can shoot one video before I go into, say, six hours of meetings, um, it doesn't drain my energy too much. And so I think you have to figure out what works for you. Like, try different ways of doing it. Try batching it. Try doing one thing a day. See which one you like more. Try doing it on the weekends. Um, you just got to see what works with what is on your plate currently. Okay. And I would say, like, give yourself permission to change things and switch things up and try different styles of doing things because there's no right or wrong way. I think it's more just acknowledging what season you're in. And there's like a lot of weeks where we have to completely change how we do all of it because we have no time because we've got a board meeting and then we've got you know quarterlies and then we've got an event and we have all this stuff, right? And so then it's like maybe we do have to batch it this week even though I don't like doing that. You have like a, a date to plan your week or your month like to sit down and see everything that's going to happen this month? Uh, for my calendar? Yeah, like a planning or something. Yeah, so I have a large admin team, so I will say they do most of that. But for most of myself, when I'm looking, I'm constantly looking on a weekly basis, I'm looking a month ahead. And I would say probably once a month, I look months ahead to be looking at things. Actually, that's probably a lie. I probably like months ahead all the time. Um, but in terms of planning things out for yourself, I would say if you don't do it at all right now, start with just planning the week. Um, and if you already plan the week, then plan a month. Thank you. For sure. And this will be the last question. Okay. <laughs> Pressure. <laughs> so my question is, what are some books, courses, programs that you can that you can recommend? Hold on. That was the last question. No, 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 that, <laughs> that you can recommend until obviously your book, One Hundred Million Dollar Leadership, comes out. Um, yeah. No. Good question. Uh, I really do like all Patrick Lencioni's books. Just got into him. Yeah. I just read uh, Naked. They're so easy for people to read. Um, Jim Collins, because his books are all done. Have you read any of his? So Jim Collins, no. he has a team of researchers. And so then they do research on all the best companies. And then they basically distill down um, what the best companies do. And then I would say outside of that, um, I am subscribed to like you know the Wall Street Journal uh, consult, like business edition, entrepreneur. So like I read a lot of the like papers people write and the studies that they're conducting on businesses because mm -hmm. I find that to be the most interesting. Like I don't want one person that's like some guru telling me what to do. Uh, I would rather, <laughs> listen, but I'm an exception. No, uh, <laughs> I don't consider myself a guru. Uh, I like reading the papers and seeing like, what are the trends that are happening? What are people seeing? You know, Google did a study on managers, not managers. No, oh, they found the managers work better. Um, I would also say Harvard Business Review. I have a subscription there. I read all of their stuff. Uh, S H R M Sherm, like I'm a subscriber of all their stuff. So like those three, I have subscriptions to. I read a lot of those articles. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of books, like love Jim Collins. Like all of his books were incredibly helpful. Patrick Lencioni, those are the two that stand out the most. The last person I would say is this, um, Matt Mokery. Uh, he's like a consultant to some of the top tech CEOs. He wrote a book called uh, The Tactical Guide to Being a CEO. And I just loved it. I asked him if he would mentor me like four years ago, and he was like, no. And I was like, okay. So we don't have any beef, but. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Thank you guys so much. Neil's going to help us wrap it up today. Woo!